At two weeks, the baby can move on its own. At four weeks, the baby has a heartbeat. Should America be labeled heartless, tallying over 50 million abortions on her soil? What's God's pulse on this silent holocaust? Stay tuned next on The Crossover. For nearly 2,000 years, Jews and Christians have been divided. But now, God is calling for the healing of past hurts and the comforting of His people. Discover how God is prophetically uniting Jews and Christians across the world today on The Crossover. Here is your host, Mitch Jerome. In Houston, Planned Parenthood has just built the largest abortion mill in the Western Hemisphere. Six-story high building, 78,000 square feet. Most protesters marched in silence, mouths taped closed to honor the unborn babies that can't speak. The protesters marched, prayed, and maintained silence, but their message was a scream for life. Rosalie was there at the protest, at the march, and babe, now that the tape is removed from your lips, what does your heart have to say on, on the matters that you were marching about? I wanted to get to the studio as quick as I could to just share what was happening in, on the inside of me. I, um, I was uh, watching as the speakers were speaking on the stage before the march, I was watching trains going behind them. And that was interesting. It reminded me of the trains that were taking Jews and others to the their deaths, in the death camps. You know, uh, Mitch, when we went to Germany to film second generation and third generation Nazi descendants and their desire to follow the death marches and the train tracks of where Jews were taken. We went to film that and it was pretty upsetting that, uh, to watch this march and I'm realizing, wait, we have a holocaust, a silent holocaust here in America and actually in the world, wherever there's abortion is allowed, yet there's nobody really making a lot of, enough noise about it. Also, I noticed that uh, the dichotomy was pretty uh, amazing. They, uh, literally, the abortion clinic is across the street from a large Catholic charismatic church. So it was like the ap apocalyptic veil was lifted and you know, you can see black and white. You know, the Catholics were the first to speak out okay. and, uh, and, uh, against abortion and it's like a smack in their face literally across the street is this clinic smack that actually looks like a Mayan temple. Smack in the face to God. Sophie Scholl was 21 years old when she was caught passing out leaflets in Munich, yeah, Germany on the university campus. She was taken for interrogation by the Gestapo and they said to her, you can recant. And she said, I can't recant. And they said, how come you feel so strongly about this, Sophie? And she said, my conscience tells me so. And we are here to say as young women that our conscience tells us that the murder of young babies is not okay. So they gave Sophie several chances to recant and she said, I will not recant. And in just a few hours after her trial, she was sent to the guillotine where she was beheaded. She gave her life up for a cause that she believed in. And she has inspired us young women in, in that day, Hitler in World War II, the murder and the Holocaust of six million Jews was the giant of her day. But the giant of our day is the giant of abortion and 50 million babies, more than 50 million babies in our nation have already suffered at the hands of abortion. And we're here to say as young women that Planned Parenthood, you, you're not wanted in our neighborhoods. Yes. Sophie Scholl, who stood up to the Nazis, paid dearly for her valor. She was beheaded. Today, Planned Parenthood is the Goliath. God calls this child to be a babe, never a fetus. 
Fetus is more of the modern day politically correct statement. It purposely diminishes God's awesome creation from a babe to a massive tissue. And I was thinking, Rosalie, when in the Bible, the story of Elizabeth and Mary coming together, they're both pregnant. Mary comes to go visit Elizabeth, who's carrying John. And in Elizabeth, the baby leaps in her womb and, and God calls it a babe. The Spartans actually took their newborn males and if they didn't live up to their criteria, if they weren't healthy, if they were um, any kind of a defect at all, they would just throw them over the cliffs. They weren't quality to be a, a Spartan soldier. They had no other purpose in life. They were killed. The Aztecs would sacrifice children demanded by their god, Tlaloc. The Incas had a ceremony called Capacoca where they sacrificed the children. And to this day in South America in the mountains, they're still finding frozen babies that were sacrificed to their God. In the Bible, to continue, remember the story of Herod. He had all the males two years and long younger killed because, of course, the king being born would be a threat to his throne is the way he perceived it. And that spirit of Herod lives on today. Herod wants to murder the prophetic. Herodes quiere destruir y matar lo profético. The question arises, what is the devil afraid of? La pregunta surge, ¿de qué le teme el diablo? Who is in the womb that the enemy is so fretful of? I'm Jim Becker. I've been a journalism teacher for many years and actually I wrote my first newspaper story in 1973. And I've seen the world change a whole lot in that time, covering a lot of different stories. But one thing that upsets me a little bit, and this is what I teach my students, is that truth can never be bested by falsehood in the public arena. But what happens when so much of what you see in the media is not the truth? and it's overbearingly, blatantly bad, or anti-good. Anti and that's why I was really concerned. That's why I think that uh, the crossover can be a powerful instrument in reaching people, because it's actually proclaiming the truth, the positive side of a lot of different things, and reaching out to people. For nearly 2,000 years, Jews and Christians have been divided. But now, God is calling for the healing of past hurts and the comforting of His people. Discover how God is prophetically uniting Jews and Christians across the world today on The Crossover. The Crossover exists to communicate to the Jewish community that there is a growing group of Christians who love them unconditionally. The focus of the Crossover program is to promote a greater understanding of the differences and similarities between Jewish and Christian customs, history and theology, while encouraging a closer walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. As a second generation Holocaust survivor, Rosalie's Jewish heritage includes parents who were protected from the Nazis by Christians. Yet for more than a decade, Mitch and Rosalie searched for meaning in life in the New Age movement. But after returning to their Judeo-Christian roots, they discovered God's purpose for their lives. 
to rebuild bridges between Christians and Jews. Now through TV, radio, the internet, speaking engagements, the healing room, and print and video resources, they are reuniting Jews and Christians in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Join Mitch and Rosalie as they tackle tough topics and welcome dynamic guests on The Crossover. The Promised Land. And I also try to make it very clear to the Christians all over the world that they are threatened to the same extent as the Jews and Israel is, are threatened. Uh, and I also say basically that Jews and Christians are waiting for the Messiah, who is a Jew from Israel who speaks Hebrew. And that Messiah is going to come to Jerusalem. And so Christians share this faith with the Jews. The Hebraic roots of Christianity. And we begin looking at Jesus through Jewish spectacles and not our Texas spectacle. Welcome back to The Crossover. There is a spirit force that is behind what's happening with abortion. It is not just an ideology, it's a demonic doctrine of hell. Come on somebody. The Bible says that in the last days there will be doctrines of devils. But I want you to know that we have been given authority. And one of the things that God wants to do in this generation is he wants us to break the power of this demonic attack and assault. If we'll do this, if we'll commit to fasting and praying over this next year. See, see what we're doing today is we're not ending the battle. We're declaring war on a principality, on a power. The demonic forces know that there is a generation of champions that are going to come up from the black community. They're going to come up from the Hispanic community. Come on now. They're scientists. They're poets. They're artists. They're a generation of those who will be an asset. They will be deliverers. There's a great awakening coming to this nation and God is going to use the black and the brown along with the white to advance his agenda. The speaker hits the nail right on the head. The battle spiritual. God must win this war against abortion. The spirit of death working through the Planned Parenthood was nurtured by its founder, Margaret Sanger. It's a big statement to make but it's quite full of fact. Just take a minute just to look at how Planned Parenthood get its feet rooted in the soil. Margaret associated with several people that their background speaks for themselves. One was a Dr. Knopf, he was a racist. He warned of the menace posed by the black and yellow race. There was a Harvard graduate, Lothrop Stardard. He was a Nazi enthusiast. He described the eugenic practices of the Nazis as humane and very humanitarian. There was another doctor, Harry Laughlin. He was quoted to purge America's bad strains. That's what Planned Parenthood was set out to do. Planned Parenthood sounds like a very benign, practical, logical thing to do, to plan your life, plan it as a parent, uh, not knowing what the great darkness is behind it. Let's take a moment and watch this clip. On behalf of a woman leader in the body of Christ, I repent that it was a woman that started the now feminist organization that took our place. But today, in the name of Jesus, Father, we pull that feminist spirit were there and they're discussing this new woman arising and the now group how did, how did that, what does that mean and how did that affect you it wasn't so much a discussion it was spiritual warfare this was a prayer movement that's one thing that's interesting about this the call and what they were doing they weren't you know screaming they were praying people had tape on their mouths you know or there was this you know as you could see in the footage and they were 
spiritual there was spiritual warfare going on and um, it really affected me and, and I realized that I need to come out of the closet you might say um, every time that we have um, received after we've decided to follow Jesus Yeshua as our Messiah we would get you know you would give money to uh, fight abortion and all that and I would throw them as soon as they'd arrive in the house I'd throw them away because I didn't think that um, uh, people should be telling women what to do with their bodies and especially uh, my situation I was a teenager and um, I was promiscuous to the point where I got pregnant and um, I was young and I was never told of another option and I was just quickly guided to this abortion cl clinic and I, I didn't know it was the wrong thing. I always thought it was just tissue, flesh. Uh, I was never told it was a baby. Um, however, um, when it was all over, I um, woke up from the anesthesia weeping for hours, not knowing why. And uh, deep, wrenching weeping. And um, So do you think that would be for all the young teens out there that have gone through an abortion, you think that was a common experience? I don't know. It's something that we don't talk about. I don't. I never really would talk about this. And the reason I chose to actually speak. So that speak, weeping. I just want to. What do you? How do you? How do you interpret that? That there was. You didn't a, even know it was a baby. No. Correct. No, but my soul knew. My soul knew that there was a, a death. And my body, I was grieving, even though my mind didn't understand. So that, that speaks volumes about people saying fetus or baby. That was an experience that, in my mind, I thought it was not a baby. Sure. And so I, um, I, I just wanted to say that, I wanted to share that with everyone on our show, that I've experienced this. I feel that we need to talk about it. Please um, feel free. Uh, to send us emails and and let us know your comments about this. Uh, I don't want to judge women who've had abortions. Um, I just and I don't want to judge those who are about to or thinking of doing it. I just want maybe people to know, you to know, who's watching today that uh, more of the facts. Consider if you're thinking of doing something like that. Uh, you might want to get an ultrasound and notice that, take a look and see it's a heart beating, there's a real person in there. And you know, this concept of, well, it's going to mess up my school or my work or my plans. You know, I think women have a right over their bodies uh, for, you know, getting your face uh, fixed or, you know, <laughs> taking a diet pill or something, but to the point of murdering a life. Um, that's not acceptable. That's not right. And uh, there was this lady at the uh, Planned Parenthood. We was a Planned Parenthood director where people, believers, were praying for her and people who worked at a, an abortion clinic for a long time and never judged her, just prayed for her that God would reveal to her and the people who work at this abortion clinic that it's not right. Watch this watch uh, her testimony. You know, for a long time, I worked for them. I worked for Planned Parenthood. And now I work for God. Men cannot work for Planned Parenthood and work for God. The two don't mix. God is not in the walls of the abortion clinic, but 80% of women that have abortions are Christians. This is not right. Women and men who work in the abortion industry claim to be Christians. I claim to be a Christian when I worked in that abortion industry. This is not right. We have to be reaching these men and women and clinic workers every time they are going into those clinics. We have to be stirring something in their heart. We have stirring God in their heart. This rally is wonderful, but what are we going to do after today? This is only the beginning. This is the beginning.
understand that. Not by condemning them, not by judging them, but by loving them. Because we do love them. And sometimes it's hard to love the people that work in the abortion industry. But I would not be here standing in front of you today helping to save lives if people in Bryan, Texas had not been outside loving me compassionately every single day when I went to work. Rosalie read where the abortions led to forced sterilizations, which led to euthanasia, which eventually led to concentration camps like Auschwitz. You're a second generation Holocaust survivor. We're tying this show into the Holocaust. Why don't you share some of that? Well, what's been happening with me ever since this march, I've been really praying and asking God to you know, what do I do with this? I feel we need to be a voice. We, we can't be silent anymore. Uh, the babies are silent, so somebody has to speak for them. And um, as far as the Holocaust situation, I'm a second generation Holocaust survivor. There were people who risked their lives to protect my family from uh, death for a whole year in Hungary, okay? So that's how important life is. People risk their life for my parents' life. When my family escaped to, after the war, and communism took over in Hungary, during the Hungarian Revolution, they escaped. My mother got pregnant in Austria. My father wanted to abort me because it was inconvenient. They had to come to America, and he didn't have a job or anything, but I wasn't aborted. So many times I could have lost my life. I could never have been born. But I was protected and was born. And here, on top of it, I myself end a life within me. And I believe that doing this show and helping the uh, anti-abortion movement will, will be a healing process. Here's some startling information that uh, on studying this that was shocking to me about America. Here we are talking about the Nazis and the, what they had done and the eugenics that they perpetrated. But did you realize that the Nazi administrators that went on trial for the crimes, the war crimes in Nuremberg, said that they justified the mass sterilization of over 450,000 people by citing that this was allowed in the United States. That was their inspiration from the United States. And on researching that, it was true. In Indiana, for 21 years from 1907 forward, they had more than 30 states followed after that. They had compulsory sterilization laws, uh, people that were living in the mental institutions. And in Connecticut, even going back to 1896, marriage laws were past combined with eugenics, where the epileptic, the imbecile, and the feeble-minded, however you define those, could not marry. These were laws on the books. The Germans would take these laws and say, hey, they took it to a new level, did they not? It's one thing to deal with the deformed and the, and, and the impaired, but the Germans took it to a level where obviously a whole group of people, the Jewish people that were contributing to society, supporting their families, uh, raising up the standard of living were being annihilated and he was stretching the eugenics and, and all that from the America laws that were passed. Rosalie, tell me again the story of the rabbi that you read regarding a baby that was born with Down syndrome. There's a rabbi that apparently that uh, whenever uh, someone with Down syndrome would come in the room or see them because they live a short amount of uh, time he would uh, bow down, he would, uh, with great respect, uh, bow down uh, to them and uh, 
with the belief that they had a short life because they were such a great soul, they, had, they could achieve so much in such a short period of time. Because the goal of life in Judaism is for tikkun olam, you know, for us to heal the world. One of the things I learned in studying the Holocaust is it's too big to, uh, people can't understand six million Jews, you know, and, uh, and so many million others. But one story at a time, people can understand. One person at a time. And what hit me is what I believe what we have to do with this anti-abortion prayer movement is for each believer to adopt you know, adopt children, definitely adopt spiritually or uh, tangibly a one woman, a girl that you know who's in trouble, who's pondering what to do. If we could just find, each believer could find one of those to minister to and mentor, what could happen? Join Mitch and Rosalie as they reach an ever-growing worldwide audience through The Crossover. We invite you to become a Crossover partner right now by calling the number on your screen. For your monthly gift of $30 or more, you will receive The Crossover Partnership Pack, which includes a DVD of today's program, a personal greeting and prayer message from Mitch and Rosalie, more information about The Crossover Project, as you continue to support The Crossover each month, you will receive a new Crossover DVD, a monthly ministry report, and your name will be added to the healing room. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac can describe Let it be known today that you are God. We offer up our lives as a living sacrifice.